exciting to have you here with me today and I've got some updates to give on bocce and we are talking about building endurance in senior dogs, keeping them fit and healthy and um, thinking about some unique considerations we have to have for the senior dogs. Um, really, the more we can keep them active, keep them mobile, keep them strong, the, the better it is. Um, I know a lot of dogs, when they start losing mobility, especially some of the large dogs, um, sometimes it's that's, that's the decision maker whenever they're getting old and, and aging and we can't keep them with us any longer. Um, Bachi, uh, if those of you, if you have not been following, he is my, he's a Belgian Malinois. I have a couple pictures I'm going to show you of him. He's going to be, uh, 11 in about three weeks and a little bit over a month ago, about a month and a half ago, he had emergency surgery for bloat. So I've been in the process of kind of bringing him back, getting him conditioned again. Plus, you know, as dogs are aging, it's very common for other health issues and things to crop up, um, just like us, you know, as we get older. Um, he's had some mobility issues. Um, he's got some deterioration of um, some, some discs in his, in his neck. And so he's not unlike a lot, of, a lot of senior dogs where, you know, they're aging and you have your traditional aging process that's happening, but it's not unusual for them to have other types of health issues on top of that. So I'm going to be sharing with you what I've been doing. And hey, Rami, thank you for joining us. And Kim, Charlie, thank you. Yeah, I was trying to think about uh, what topic to do. Charlie says this is a great topic for humans too. And actually, I wrote this thinking about the dogs, but I think my recommendations also can apply for humans. Um, but he, Bachi is doing really well and, uh, I'm, I'm in the midst of this and, and definitely when I take him out, um, when I do training and conditioning and going on walks and hikes with him, uh, it's very different than my younger dog. My younger dog is like eight. He's going to be eight soon, but there's very special considerations and very special things that I have to do and keep in place to make sure I have a really productive time and uh, enjoyable and attend to the unique needs of a senior dog, especially if there's been some health issues or mobility issues. Um, so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, I, if you want a copy of my slides, I don't have anything really fancy, but if you just put slides, write down slides, um, uh, I will reach out uh, or just private message me if you want your email address and, and let me know slides and I can get the slides to you. So uh, Kim said your older border collie is very active, but if she's too active, she has a hard time getting up. Yeah, I've, how many of you have um, high energy, high drive dogs, uh, senior dogs? Because those are also unique challenges because they don't know their own limits. I mean, not just a high drive dog. I mean, that can come with many dogs, but I do find it's been a interesting challenge with uh, my dog Bachi because he, his heart and his desire is more than what his body can handle. And so that brings some unique challenges. So let, let's hop right into this. This is him. I, I was gonna um, bring him up uh, live. I think he's sleeping right now, but uh, I'll, I'll have to bring him on another day and, and, and show. But uh, this photo was taken just a couple weeks ago after surgery um, on recovery and he had surgery. He was uh, 10 years, 10 months old. Um, so it's about a month and a half ago that he had it. So like I said, um, he was in good shape, but um, it has had some health issues. Like I said, some mobility issues, some deterioration of the spine. Um, he's been retired for quite a number of years um, from the sport and stuff. So Kim, you've got to create, create one of those crazy dogs, huh? <laughs> so um, now the first thing I want to say here is, I mean, this is, this is with any dog. But this is especially true with your senior dogs. You really, you need to be prepared and you need to be very, very observant of your dog. You have to really be in tune with your dog because as our dogs, if you've experienced it, as our dogs get older, there's a lot of times like it's up and down, up and down. They can have a really, really, really good day. And then the next day they're really struggling. Like Kim said, you know, you might have a really active dog and the next day they're sore and they don't want to get up or move, right? Um, and, and, yeah. Uh, and so we got to control them. Hey, Giselle, good to see you. Uh, Giselle, I know you like working with senior dogs, but wouldn't you say we've got some unique challenges with these senior dogs when we're doing this? So, um, all dogs, we have to pay really close attention to, um, but they each other unique things and senior dogs. Like I said, um, one day, oh, here's another example. 
at the beginning of your hike, your dog, your senior dog could be just like amazing, like acting like they're a spring chicken, you know? And then in the middle of the hike, they may tweak something or stumble or just trip or, or just out of the blue. And then they might just start limping really badly. That happened to me a couple times with Bocce. Um, we were just walking around at the park. He was carrying a toy in his mouth. It fell to the ground and he was kind of like, oh, grab the toy. And then he just started limping really badly. And it was just a small little thing, but he kind of like lunged at the toy. It wasn't even hard, but because his body's not the same, um, it doesn't respond the same way. I've also been where I've been, you know, hiking on, you know, walking him on a trail. He's doing really, really well. And then all of a sudden he, he starts, you know, limping or all of a sudden his energy just drops. And so it can be in the midst of a single walk and, or a hike, or it can be from one day to the next. Um, you know, one day he might be struggling and his balance is not good. And the next day he's just trotting around like, you know, like he's three years younger. So we really have to pay attention and, and, and base it on them. So, uh, hey, Katrina. Hey, Trina. You've got me on the big TV. <laughs> Trina's my sister. <laughs> if you guys see her in the in the chat box. Um, but yeah, uh, Trina, how, how old are your dogs? I think you're you're getting some seniors. They're getting up there. So um, getting started. So let me give you some tips on getting started. Number one is you got to know your baseline. Now, remember, th their, their activity level can go up and down within hours, within the same trip or across days. But you, you do have to have an idea of what their baseline is. For example, right now, I know Bachi, he can't go for a three mile hike. OK, that's not his baseline. And I kind of learned his baseline after surgery. I took him for a walk. Um, we didn't go, we, we didn't go very long, but, um, partway through the walk, just his whole energy dropped, his, his excitement dropped. He started getting tired and I was like, Whoa, buddy, you know, it's time to go back to the car. And it was about 0.6 miles into the walk. And I noted that. Okay. So, um, I didn't really know after surgery exactly where his baseline was, but we just went out for a walk. He had a good day. And I just really noticed when he, his, his energy, his interest, his mobility, when things just started to go downhill, luckily I was close to the car and I said, all right, we're done for the day. Let's go back. Let's go back home. So that right there kind of told me, all right, let's tentatively look at our baseline is about, about a half mile, a half mile, 0.6 mile walk. And like I said, this was pretty, this was after surgery stitches were taken out. So, um, uh, yeah, Trina's got, you got a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. So yeah, you got one about the same age as Knox. So you got to know that, know that baseline. And if you don't know, when you're out with your dog, you really pay attention. And when your dog starts to, you know, if they start on the walk, like Bachi, he's like, oh, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I mean, I'm like, he, he's like wanting to drag me down the, he's so excited. Um, but then I notice after, depending on the weather, but maybe a half mile in or so, there's a distinct change in his energy level, his motivation level. Um, sometimes his mobility kind of changes. He's not, not as agile on his feet. So when that happens, when you start to notice the dog is, you know, a little bit less energy, less focus, less drive, note how, how long into the walk is it, the hike? How long into the run? Um, what's the distance and, and pay attention to when that happens. So I knew I actually had on my phone, I had Strava. Any of you use Strava? S T R Strava. Um, it's, it's a free app you can put on your phone. And I religious, I religiously now keep that with me when I go out with Bachi. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Right. Uh, but that's, that's really, uh, uh, really helpful. So the next thing is when you know that baseline track your progress, because here's the thing. If you're not paying close attention, like the other day I took Bachi out and he was so full of energy. And if I just listened to him and said, all right, let's go. Oh, he wants to go. He wants to go. Let's keep going. We would have done too much. I knew that his limit right now on a good day is about a mile. So I know like if it's an out and back or a loop, I know after a half mile, I need to start heading back to the car. But if I listen to him, you would think he's going to go 10 miles, but I know because I've been tracking my progress. I know that after about 0.5, 0.6 miles, his energy starts to drop. 
And so even though he's raring to go, he's excited, he's, he's wanting to like kind of drag me down, you know, the trail. Um, I'm like, no, no, I pull out my phone. I look at Strava. I said, we've gone 0.4 miles. Let's go one more 10th of a mile. We're going to turn around and go back. And I would not know that if I, if I was not tracking that progress, if I was just going by observing him, I would have kept going. And then I, by the time it was, he started showing some fatigue or struggling, I, I would struggle to get him back to the car. And, um, that, and I kind of know from experience one time I listened to him because I was like, wow, he's feeling really good. And we win a, maybe a little extra one or two tenths of a mile. And we had to take um, significant breaks and water breaks because uh, going back to the car, he just, that energy just quickly started dropping. So again, you got to pay attention to your dog, but sometimes you can't go by what their dog is saying when they're super excited and, and really wanting to go. Track your progress. If you know your baseline, you know that if your dog's baseline is a mile, you're not going to go two or three miles the next day. You can gradually build up to it. And this has been so important with Bocce because you would think that he has the capability to go and go and go. And I know that he'll like crash coming back and um, be dragging it and there's dragging to get back to the car. So I just religiously, I've got that phone in my back pocket, put on Strava, start it in the middle of my walk. I keep checking it. And when it gets to 0.5 miles, I'm like, I don't care how good you're feeling, buddy. We're turning around and we're going back because sure enough, we start going back and I notice a difference. So um, you want to just build that baseline slowly, again, being in tune to what your dog, how your dog is responding. Um, some days you may decide to keep your dog at home. Some days you may cut it in half, but you have to pay attention to the dog, but you need to know your baseline. Because um, if, you're, if your dog is feeling really good and you're going to grow your baseline, you want to grow it gradually and you don't want to end up doing too much too soon or you're, you're, you can be hurting your dog. For some dogs, it, I mean... Oh, especially if they've got health problems, it could be, you know, some dogs, you got heart issues. Um, they may have blood pressure issues. There's a lot of heart disease, um, uh, things like cardiomyopathy uh, that a lot of times we don't even know our dogs have it. So, um, so just be aware. And if your dog does have some specific health issues, diseases, make sure you understand, talk with your veterinarian and see what kind of limitations there are or kind of signs. If there are some potential negative side effects, you need to be aware of. Um, and if your dog is on medication, um, be aware of that. Even things like the heart rate and the breathing. And some, sometimes um, if you see a big jump, it could be, you know, a really red, a red flag that something's not right with your dog, but there are also medications that could raise the heart rate, the resting heart rate, or lower the heart rate. So um, if, you're, if they're on medication, check with your, your veterinarian. So um, the next one is, and, and you know, I kind of, I every now and then would track progress. I didn't do it so religious. I would, I would sometimes track it and sometimes wouldn't, but now with Bachi and where he is and his fitness level and his aging, um, I always, I always track how far we're going and when to turn around. Uh, the next one. Uh, monitor, monitor your dog. I already mentioned some of this is uh, ob observing your dog, observing your dog really closely. So, so some of the things that I'm going to observe with um, with Bachi is, of course, I notice his breathing, um, his his panting, his energy level, um, his mobility. You know, is he fluid? Is he walking um, nice, nice and is, is he pretty agile? Is he kind of dragging his toenails? Or those, these are the types of things I'm going to pay attention to. And um, my, my younger dog, actually, he's going to be eight. I will periodically, I do candy cross. So he's, he's walking ahead of me. And periodically, I'll stop and I'll be like, okay, buddy, let me look at your ears. How red are your ears? Let me look at your tongue. How are you handling this? And I'm constantly checking in with my dog to see how they're doing. Um, and then also what I'll do, depending on what, what I'm kind of feedback I'm getting back from my dog, I may um, have to take some rest breaks, get them in the shade, water breaks. Um, I, I did some water breaks and I'm like, okay, Bachi, you know, I'm not going to continue on this trail until you drink some water. <laughs> and um, cause he's so excited. He wants to go, but I know, you know, you're getting a little bit of hot. We're going to stop. We're going to rest. You're going to drink some water. And then when I see the tongue starting to get smaller, um, not panting so much, then we're going to continue on. Um, I, I'll watch this. I was the other day really watching his panting. 
So as he's getting all excited, the tongue is getting wider. The tongue is hanging um, further out of his mouth. His mouth, when he's panting, is wider. So I stopped. Um, we rested. I gave him some water. And I did not continue until I, I saw the physical improvement of his tongue and his mouth, the length of his tongue, the width of the tongue, and the mouth of the, how wide it was when he was breathing. So I looked at all of those physical signs to give me evidence that he, he is getting the heart rates coming down a little bit back to normal, you know, more resting. Um, he's not stressing so much in the heat or the humidity. It was a, it was a little bit humid that day. And then I'll say, okay, now look, you're doing better. And now we're going to continue. I did that with Knox too. When we're doing Canny Cross. Um, I'll be jogging a little bit on a warm day and then we'll walk and I'll say, okay, we're going to stop. I'm going to do a water break. We don't move. We don't continue going until I see a distinct physical improvement in how he's doing. So um, when you're building endurance, here's the thing is you want, you need to kind of push your dog kind of to that next level. If you're always doing the same speed, the same distance, the same, you know, um, intensity, your, your dog's not going to, to go to the next level. So it's a challenge here with the senior dog. If you want to build endurance, you have to periodically kind of challenge the body to go a little bit further or a little bit harder or a little bit faster but you have to monitor the dog closely because sometimes with an older dog, um, that little bit harder, a little bit faster can be the difference of your dog overheating, your dog going lame and things like that. And so that's what, another reason why you want to monitor them really closely because then you adjust what you're doing, get your dog kind of back, back to that baseline. And then if you want to go another half mile, if you're able to do that, you monitor your dog and then you can continue going. And that way, when I do that, I can get more distance out of my dog. So for example, when I was doing candy cross with Knox the other day, it was kind of warm, a little bit humid. If I was not monitoring him closely, we probably would have only been able to do a mile, a mile and a half. But because I was like, we're resting, we're gonna slow you down, we're gonna go a little faster, we're gonna slow you down. And I kept adjusting what I was doing based on his physical response. Um, I was able to get in almost four miles. Um, and now he'd been used to doing that distance. I didn't all of a sudden do four miles, but I would, on, in those kind of conditions, I would not have been able to go four miles on a more humid day. Um, if I just got him and just started running with him, like he would have possibly ended up with heat stroke if I had done that. So it's really, really important with all dogs, but especially for your senior dogs. So, um, uh, Charlie said it's helpful to track your dog's working temperature and know their baseline. Yes, definitely. Um, the more data you collect on your dog, whether it's the, the body temperature, um, the, the mental state, the physical reactions, um, that would be definitely ideal to know your dog's, you know, kind of that resting state. And when your dog is at a more excited or working state, what is that body temperature? To be honest, I don't know. How many of you have actually taken your dog's temperature? So, or how many of you even have a thermometer <laughs> that you can carry to take with you? So that is the ideal situation, but I know kind of realistically, every, most everybody I've trained with, I've actually, all the years I've been training sport dogs and stuff, I've never seen anybody on the field or people um, pull out a thermometer <laughs> and, and test, but that would be ideal. And especially if you're in, um, in, a, in a stressful situation working your dog, but that would be the most ideal situation but you still got to watch those physical responses because body temperature can vary. Uh, Charlie said you started tracking it and you do carry up. Excellent. Yeah. But um, Erica said it's uh, so hard when their spirit is willing, but the body can't keep up. Yeah. That's it. Um, I'm, that's where I'm struggling with, with Bachi. He, he, when he starts on his hike, he wants to run. Like he wants to run and jog with me. And, but I know he physically can't handle it he wants to go so badly and go jogging with me, but I know I can't let him do it because um, like I said, uh, the, I've seen him come up lame. Um, he, he's dragging to get back to the car. I know that he's not gonna last a mile if I do that. Um, the next one is go prepared. Now, again, this is in all instances, you, you should always go prepared, but let me tell you a little bit of what I do. Um, what I do with him when I prepare to go. So number one is one thing I've noticed as he's getting older is um, he doesn't acclimate to the temperature as well. He doesn't deal with the heat. He heats up faster, takes him longer to cool down. Um, is, is, and I mean, he's not as fit as he used to be. 
So when your dog is super, super fit, they can regulate the body temperature better, they can recover faster, they can deal with the heat better. As your dog's older and you know, if they've got some limitations, they're not as fit, uh, it very likely can be that they just th th their, their body just isn't adjusting and can't acclimate as quickly and is not gonna recover as quickly to exercise. So what I do with him is um, I always I take a backpack. I always carry some um, water with me. Uh, I carry a bowl for the water uh, and I make I take a couple bottles or you can get a backpack that has the, the bladder that goes in with the water. So I always take some water with me. Um, and also I used to, I have a mobility harness that I would only use to get in and out of the car. He doesn't really need it day to day, just climbing into the car and getting out. Um, but one day he, he, a couple times he's tripped and stumbled and his balance is just not as good as it used to be. And just little things you would never think I would, you know, before I would have never thought would trip him. And a couple times, just something little, he just kind of stumbles and he just did a nosedive into the ground. And he's he's about 70 pounds, maybe a little bit over 70 pounds. So after he did that, I just go ahead and keep the mobility harness on him because if I get into a situation where he trips or he falls or he needs some extra help, um, because he's a large dog um, and I don't have a, I have some herniated discs in my back, um, I just go ahead and keep the mobility harness on him, especially if he tripped a couple times. He's gotten up on his own, but what if, you know, what if he fell or what if he hurt himself or, you know, got pretty lame? And it's going to be really hard for me to pick him up and, and haul him out very far. So at least if I have a mobility harness on, I have that as like an emergency backup. Like I said, he doesn't need it to go on our hikes. But the couple times where he's, he's stumbled, he's fallen, I'm like, no, I want that just as like an emergency backup. So depending on where your dog is with the aging process and mobility, you might not need something like that. But um, it gives me a sense of security knowing that I have that in case, you know, he needs some extra assistance. Um, I always keep my cell phone on me and I try to keep my cell phone charged um, in in case there's an emergency, you just never know. Um, and you know, after my emergency trip to the vet, um, you know, it's just always, it's always good to, especially if you're going out by yourself, um, to be prepared. Uh, another thing that I'm going to be purchasing is, um, a personal, like, a, they have some different devices where you can either communicate or text or, um, indicate using satellite that you, there's an emergency in case, you know, somebody needs to come in and rescue you. And where I am in, in Acadia National Park and on the island here where I live, uh, there's a lot of places where the cell phone loses connection. So um, so I'm gonna be purchasing something like that also. I'm gonna have my cell phone with me, but if I'm in an area that does not have um, a, cell, a good cell reception, if I'm out by myself, I wanna have something like that if there's an emergency. So that, that's kind of just general guidelines, not just for an older dog. Um, and, uh, and I all, another thing that I do is I have a route planned and I always keep in mind what happens if, you know, in the middle of the route, he's struggling in the middle of the route, he starts limping or whatever, whatever, you know, might be problematic. So because of where he is in that aging process and his mobility and his recovery, I don't like to go too far from the car um, because I don't want to be three miles out and my dog's struggling and I, I'm, you know, he, I need to get him to the car or help him or I can't carry him three miles. So I like to either go out and back or do a loop. And I'm, I'm very aware of um, how far I'm going if he needs some kind of physical help and, and just uh, getting back home, right? So those are some things. Um, hey, Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Uh, Jennifer said, baseline your dogs through each season, benchmark before any training deployment and on days where weather is skewed, high humidity, cold, yes. Um, cause you do, you do search work and you've got, you've got working dogs. So I would say, um, the people that I know that do monitor closely and they do temperature and stuff, I definitely, I see that more in like search and rescue world and in the working dog world, much more so than in the sport dog world. But I think that's good practice for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but especially I would say the, my personal experience where I hear, um, if I do hear of people that are really closely monitoring monitoring their dogs like that, um, I think just about any time I've seen that, it's been with search and rescue handlers. I don't know if that's been your case, Jennifer, but um, the, the ones that I've seen that where they've been really good about this, I, I it's for me, it's typically the search and rescue handlers, but that's good practice, I think, for, for, for anybody. Um, yeah. Uh, I have one more here. What's the last one? I forgot. Oh. 
Be consistent. This is hard when you've got an older dog and you know one day they're feeling good and the next day they're not. Um, if your dog needs some time off, you have to give your dog time off. You don't want to overdo it. But keep in mind that to, to maintain fitness level, to build fitness level, you have to have some consistency. You know, doing it once a month, uh, you're, 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 you really don't have an opportunity to build upon what, what that foundation. And so um, I try really hard. I mean, ideally, you want your dogs to be active every day, not not like big structured activity, but you want them to be active, be able to get out, and move and, you know, not be locked up, not be in a crate, the more mobile you want to keep them mobile. Um, but what I try to do is for, you know, when I go out on our hikes or go out for the mile hike and things like that, I try to for me, ideally, I'd like to get at least at least three days a week with bocce if I can. I would love to get five, but my schedule is really hard. And what I what I actually do now, things have kind of shifted, is if I have limited time. So like normally if I had like my, my working dog, my sport dog, my competition dog, my dog I focus on training, they all get exercise, but then you know that dog gets more emphasis. Now with the needs for bocce, and I, I really have to stay on top of this. He has to stay strong. He has to stay mobile. If I am, if I don't have time to exercise, and if a dog has to go a couple days without getting some kind of structured exercise, my oldest dog gets priority because if he loses muscle mass, more muscle mass, if he loses strength, it's going to have a much more of a bigger impact, a negative impact on his life than my younger dog who's healthier, stronger, and fitter. And so that's been kind of a shift before because he had enough exercise to kind of maintain, but now it's really, really important that I have to stay on top of my older dog, my oldest dog, to keep him mobile, keep him active on the days he's feeling good and keep him strong. So I will, like I said, if I'm short on time and somebody needs to, you know, doesn't get an extra session or an extra hike or um, uh, if Bachi has not gotten in three days that week, um, he's my priority because of the, the, the negative fallout if, if I can't maintain this fitness level. So that's going to be really important. Um, Charlie says, uh, do you still, uh, dedicate strength? Oh, you just read my mind. I've got another, my next slide is on this. Yeah. He was asking about, do I dedicate strength balance work with Bachi? If so, can I describe? Yeah, that has changed too. Even just in the last few months since I've done some videos for you guys. Um, and it's, it's, it's been sad because it's, it's a, he's because of it's a decrease. So yeah. So that's the senior challenges. If you watched my Facebook live, Oh, about six months ago, um, his exercise for things like strength and um, cardio is we were doing things like trotting in the backyard. He was going over the Cavaletti, um, sometimes trotting or, or um, doing short little runs in the backyard. Um, we were doing some exercises like sit, stand, doggy squats. Uh, he he can't do some of that stuff anymore because of just the decline and and his mobility issues. And so um, with him, what's really important, what I find for the seniors to, especially the large dogs to keep the mobility, because like I said, if he can't get around on his own, I can't be carrying him everywhere. Um, I thought I had, okay, I thought I had bullet points here, but let, let me just walk you through it. So for me, the things for the senior dogs is um, strength, balance and body awareness that's the biggest so the biggest thing that i've really seen deteriorating the the fastest as he's been aging over the last two years so what i like to do um some of the traditional strength training exercises i used to do he, he um if i try them like he, he might come up lame um he gets sore like he just can't do some of those exercises anymore so some of the things that I do is we have a wobble board. Do you guys know what a wobble board is? I bought mine from Fit Paws, but you can make them. But one of the things I do is um, I put I have a wobble board in the garage. And when I take them out to go to the bathroom and bring them in and out to go to the bathroom, sometimes what I do is I make them go over the wobble board a few times. And I'll put my foot on it so it's not completely, you know, totally wobbly. But I'll have them walk over it, walk over it, sit on it. So I'm kind of challenging a little bit of his balance, his body awareness, and I'm using that wobble board. It's it's easier than what I some of the exercises I used to do. The other thing that I do is I like to change the surface. 
because he's had some mobility issues, some loss of sensation, some knuckling of the hind feet. I like to do some, um, some things that are going to not only challenge at his level, challenge his mo mobility and body awareness, but giving him like different surfaces to walk on. So I have some a hill by my house and there's some rocky areas and a little bit of a rough ground, not very rough, but for him. So what I do is I'll make a point whenever I'm walking him that we'll go, go down the hill, just slowly walking up the hill. I'll make a point to walk him like on the smooth area, put him on the bumpy surface, walking through some of the rocks, not real, real rocky, but changing up the surface. And then the other thing that I do is I have a balcony with some steps. And what I'll do is in my new house is I actually will do laps. If I can't go out hiking and go out for a mile hike with him, if he hasn't gotten in his exercise, sometimes what I do is I do laps around the house and we have two, two stair steps and they're not super high and he can handle those by himself. So we'll go around the house and he goes up the stairs and down the stairs, up the stairs and down the stairs. And it's only about four steps. But I notice sometimes he'll do like three laps and I can tell on the steps because that's strength training, going up the steps, walking down, step, climbing up the steps. We're making it more challenging than just walking on the flat. So, um, so I can definitely tell like one day we did five laps. So he went up, down, up, down, you know, just a couple steps. And I could tell a difference between the first, the first round versus the fifth round. So that's another area of kind of building endurance. So when he started, you know, he might after surgery and as he's starting to recover, he might have only did maybe two to three laps around the house. And I could tell on the steps whenever his energy and the mobility started, you know, decreasing. I'm like, OK, that's enough. And then the last time I did it, um, we did uh, five laps around. So I'll use things in my environment as far as looking at the surface. Um, going up a hill, down a hill, um, small steps, not steep steps, but climbing up safely going down a another thing that I, I did once but he's not um he's not ready for it right now I, I i'm not sure if he will ever be ready for it in his age but uh another thing that i did one time when he was feeling really good is um i was walking with the harness and i attached the leash to the harness and just a little bit of pressure not a lot but while he was walking it was kind of like candy cross but i just let him pull just a little bit put a little bit of resistance on that harness and that's creating some, some strength training, some resistance training. So, um, so what I found Charlie, cause that, that was a good question is some of the traditional exercises I used to use with some of the equipment stuff um, is, is too hard for him now. And so I've kind of changed up kind of what we do in the environment, trying to think about um, using his body weight and using things like, you know, small stair steps, using the harness and kind of building a little bit of a resistance, doing things like that um, is, like I said, I've, I've seen a, 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 a big difference as, as he's aged over the last six months, what we used to do for the six months. And I have videos on that, um, the, those activities. Um, yeah, it would have been a decline. He does have some good days and some days I see him getting better. So Noel, good to see you. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so those are some of the senior challenges. Um, it's going to vary depending on where your dogs are. Like I said, where he was five months ago is very different from where he is now. And sadly, you know, months from now as they age, things deteriorate. But the more active you are, as long as they can withstand it, Keep it at their level, um, but but keep them active uh, if you can, as long as they're not in pain. And don't let them just become couch potatoes. Don't let them, you know, don't go and focus on your sport dog and your competition dog and your senior dog's going to chill at home. Um, I mean, it's fine if he's going to chill at home, but give him something structured. And, and like I said, try to give a daily activity and um, build some structured activity. If you want to build that endurance, you want to gradually build that up. Um, whether it's the intensity, the distance, the the the, the amount of time you're working with him, uh, if you want to do that, try to focus at least three days a week if you can. Uh, the the typical rule of thumb I tell people is when you're increasing, what inc only change one variable at a time. So if you're going to increase the number of days per week, the distance, the intensity, there's a lot of variables, right? I can walk further, I can go um, on hills, I can do it on a more humid day. 
I would recommend, and I always recommend this, especially for the senior dogs, if you're going to make it more challenging, change one variable at a time. The typical rule of thumb I tell people is look at increasing and making it more challenging by about 10%. But in a senior dog, I find it's so variable. It really, one day I might be able to increase it, but the next day we have to go backwards. Um, and I really find that as they're aging, as they get older, depending on other health issues, it really can vary just hour to hour and day to day. But if your dog is feeling really good and you're used to doing, you know, three days a week or four days a week, or you're used to doing two miles, when you are ready to make it a little bit more challenging, pick one variable, only do it by a small increment, work on that level um, multiple days a week for maybe a few weeks, and then if your dog if your dog is doing well then look at taking it to the next level increase it another another bit but not too much so um charlie says how much uh do you reduce calories to maintain a healthy weight any specific dietary changes uh, again another excellent question i don't calorie count and i don't feed my dogs by like um you know feed him so many cups per day I do it by my dog's body condition and how my dog looks. And um, if my dog looks like he's gained a little bit of weight, I start cutting back. And if it looks like he's getting a little thin, I add more. And I've noticed a distinct change in how much I give bocce, but I have not, um, I'm not counting calories and I don't go and consciously say, you're getting so many cups a day. I go by how he looks and I just day by day gradually adjust it as needed. And over time, I've noticed there's been a substantial decrease in the amount of food he's taking in um, as he's getting older, um, and especially around the surgery and stuff because he, he was less active. Um, but I don't, um, uh, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't calorie count. Um, one thing that I did do was when he was younger and more active, I did switch to a food that was not as high in calories and, you know, not as high in fat because he started gaining some weight. I started cutting back, but um, I, I didn't need a real high pro, you know, high carb, high fat. So one of the things that I did was I did adjust the type of food so it just didn't have so much in it. So, um, and then I still would adjust basically on how my dog looks. Um, and I love using um, the Purina has a body score system. You can just Google it, Purina body score system. And that's what I use for observing my dog. I have some um, Facebook live videos on that. But yeah, I, I totally go by how my dog's body condition, how my dog looks. And, um, and it, it varies, you know, on activity level and things like that. And there may be certain times of the year I cut back on his food, certain times of the year I increase it. And also, you know, if I'm picking up and doing more of these hikes with him, then he may get a little bit more food, but it's all variable based on the dog in front of me, um, his overall body condition and what his weight looks like day to day. And I literally, when I, you know, when I feed him in the morning or feed him at the night, I, I do that. Um, another thing that I've done, one adjustment that I have done, Charlie, is um, after his surgery, um, I am feeding him because it was for for bloat. And we don't know 100 percent, you know, direct correlations. Well, we know some correlations, but causal connections as far as what causes bloat. There's a lot that's unknown, but I just would rather be a little bit safe. And to me, it makes sense not to give him a whole bunch of food at once, which I never did. But I do. Um, I'm more conscious of you know, kind of breaking up his food and kind of spreading it out, not giving him um, um, too much at once. I always did that, but I'm more careful even now, so after his um, surgery for bloat. So um, that's kind of the changes that I've made. Um, Elizabeth said, what about increasing protein for senior dogs as long as they are fairly healthy? Um, I'm not an expert in nutrition. Um, so I'm not gonna say, you know, as far as um, Dr. Uh, Athena Kepler, who, who teaches for us in the Northeast Canine Conditioning Academy, she would definitely be the one to ask. But, um, but I have heard, like I said, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to quote, I don't know which article it was, but um, I have heard some people, and, and I've read some where they say, oh, seeing your dog, they don't need as much protein. Um, but because of what's happening during the aging process and the need to maintain um, strength and muscle, that it's it could very likely be the opposite that they actually need more protein, but I, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna kind of hold off on that. Like I said, I'm not an, I, I know my fitness stuff, 
but I'm, I'm not an expert in the nutritional area. Um, so, and I don't have that article exactly in front of me to say where I was reading that from. So I would just say, um, that would be a question for like Dr. Kepler, or, um, if you also Googled, I'm sure there's some research articles and stuff out there. Um, but what, what I do is I don't, I don't give any kind of special food. I just give them a good, you know, quality food and, um, make adjustments based on, um, based on the dog in front of me and also how they're responding to the food. Sometimes uh, in, uh, years ago, I had to completely change his food because he was having a lot of loose stools and just wasn't responding well. I also tried um, some raw with him when we were having some skin issues. And, um, and I really, um, he actually did, I tried the raw. Um, I tried different things with raw and I was having, uh, he was having itchy skin and, and um, other reactions. And I actually found a, a food that he did really, really well on. So I'm like, you know, yeah, I, could, I see the benefits of, of raw, but he does well on this food. So that's what I'm going to give him, right? So, uh, hey, Johnny says, you just logged in. Um, oh, <laughs> what are my thoughts on a raw diet? <laughs> no, I didn't talk about that. But um, yeah, uh, I think I, I've known of amazing, amazing transformations for dogs that have had issues and health issues and, and raw diet has been very, 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 very good. Um, I know dogs, um, like I said, uh, Bachi didn't respond really well. And uh, I mean, I tried it for a while and um, there, it, was, it was really, there was very few things I could give him where I had a good response with him. So uh, I'm not kind of I guess I'm like, I'm like a, when people say a balanced trainer, right? When they, you know, whether it's all positive or if you do other methods, when it comes to, um, I see positives and I, I, I see, I've heard good stories and bad stories on both ends. So what I say is you got to treat the dog in front of you. Um, and I, you know, if raw works really well, well for your dog, and I've heard lots of stories, then, you know, that's, then that's great for the dog. Um, I've also heard stories where, you know, dogs that didn't do well on raw and they've had other diets that they did really well on. So, um, I, you know, I've known of dogs, of course it has to be quality food, but I've known of dogs to do really well on, you know, with and without raw. And I've also known of dogs to do very poorly. So, um, so in my opinion, um, I think either one could be, could work, but it needs to be balanced. You need to make sure you have uh, the right nutrients. You need to have high quality food and you have to, it has to be based on the dog in front of you. Um, what works for one dog does not necessarily work for another. I would also say if you're doing raw is if it's new to you to find somebody who, uh, you know, who is an expert in the area, uh, a nutritionist, somebody who, who knows this like the back of their hand, who knows the research, who knows, you know, have really studied it in depth and have somebody guide you through it. Um, I would not recommend somebody trying to just try to figure it all out on their own because there can be some pretty negative side effects if you've got um, the diet poorly balanced and the dog is not getting what the dog needs and you're going over time with an imbalance in the diet. And that could have you know really negative, with any, with any diet, you can have a really negative effect with that. But, um, but I would say if somebody's wanting to explore a raw, um, I mean, what I would do is I would go to the experts and get get support and mentoring and coaching and would not try to figure it out just on, you know, Dr. Google. <laughs> right. So. Um, and yeah, we do know now I will say this in the research that I've studied, um, we do know that, um, you know, supplementing well, depending on what the diet is, whether you call it a supplement, but we do need know that there are definitely certain oils that um that are beneficial for the dog certain supplements that are going to be good sometimes you know definitely we want to add it to the diet but depending on what the diet is some diets don't need the supplements because the diet already has what you need so again it's going to depend on the individual diet but um there are research studies showing for example for um for joint joint supplements um if you go to uh, oh gosh this is my mind is blank it's the, um, it's the working dog, uh, it's in Maryland and they do all of the, the veterinary sports medicine. My mind is blank, I quote them and cite them all the time. If somebody can remember who it is that I mentioned. It's in Maryland and it's the um, Sher Sherman Knapp, Dr. Sherman Knapp and his wife, um, they own the, the center. 
And they have a, there's a number of research articles if you go to their website and they've got some research articles that talk about studies where they combine some of the supplements for the joint supplements combined with different types of oils. And um, when they balance them together, they had some positive responses when you actually were combining the supplements with different types of oils to go with it. Um, but I, like I said, that is not my area of expertise, so I'm not gonna uh, even attempt to try to quote um, what the, the research was showing. Yes. Um, veterinary orthopedic sports specialist, V O S M V O. Um, I don't know if that's the same one. V O S M. Thank you. Yes, man. I, I reference them all the time. I, I love the work that they do and my mind just V O S M. Let's see. Um, veterinary orthopedic sports medicine. Let me, um, let me pull this up and see if I can share this with you. It's veterinary. Yeah. It, they've got, let me see if I can pull this up and show you on the screen. Let's see. They, um, if you go to their website, I'll tell you what the website is. Bosm.com is the website. And if you go to the top of the page under resources, click on resources, and it has um, articles and white papers. And they also have some awesome, amazing um, videos there. So, um, let me see if I can see if I can pull this up here. Mm. Here we go. I'll pull it up here. I was wanted to pull it up on the screen and share it with you. I just got to change the window here. Uh, let me hide this and let me pull this one up. This is the website, Veterinary Sports Medicine. And you see at the top where it says resources. If you go to the top where it says resources and click on that, and then it takes you, it says articles and white papers. So when you go to articles and white papers, um, they've got great articles. They've got um, sports training, re rehabilitation, knee conditions, foot and heel conditions, elbow conditions. Oh, they've added more on here. Shoulder conditions, groin conditions, neurological, and right here, joint supplements. And, um, they have the joint protective agents and the oral joint supplements and um, the clinical minute. And in there, they talk about um, the types of supplements and which combinations when they add like the oil to it. Uh, so I, I would uh, definitely encourage you if you're interested in learning more to check out, I'll put this link in the, in the chat box, uh, check out the articles um, and the research that they have and some of their um, white papers, they, they make it and they write it in a way that's very accessible to people. Um, a lot of the articles, if you don't necessarily have like a medical background, <laughs> um, but it's, they've got some very accessible um, content on there. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Elizabeth and Erica. My mind just bl blanked on me. I couldn't, <laughs> I could, I kept thinking of Pen, Pen Vet Working Dog Center is also an excellent place to go. Um, I don't think they have as many articles, but sometimes they publish some of their most recent um, um, kind of white papers and some of the research they're doing. But um, if you go, that was the one that came to mind, but it's Penn, P-E-N-N, -N, Penn Vet Working Dog Center, University of Pennsylvania. And I haven't been on their website in, in a while, but if you go on their website, um, usually you can find um, some articles. They have a website with um, uh, research. Uh, and I would, uh, yeah, I would encourage you if you're interested in learning more about some of the latest, some of the research that's out there um, on hydration. I know they've got some research going on in hydration, Penn Vet Working Dog Center. I would recommend you guys check them out. So, and then let me just, um, let me pull up my slides one last time. I think I had two more slides to show you. But this is all. This is all really important stuff. So, um, so the senior trails, and then the last thing I wanted to leave you with, um, this I just touched upon a few of some very, very important things when it comes to having a well-rounded, nice, you know, balanced program for fitness for your dogs, not just for senior dogs. I mean, all dogs benefit from this. The idea is to keep your dog fit and healthy uh, ahead of time, so that as they age, you put them in in the best, you know, best possible position to age gracefully. And so um, this is it, it's, it's the www.k9fitnessquiz.com. And you, it's like a little self-assessment, a little questionnaire for you to kind of get uh, touch tabs on where is your canine fitness knowledge? 
what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are areas that you possibly need to explore when it comes to canine fitness? So I'm going to put that in um, the chat box. But what you do is you take the questionnaire and it's in different categories and it will email you your answers and it will categorize by points. So you can see by category which are your strengths, which areas are your strengths, and which areas are possible areas to work on. But that's the canine fitness quiz. And then the last thing I wanted to share with you, let me pull this up here, is if you're really serious about canine fitness and you're super passionate about canine fitness and you want to learn more about, you know, helping to prevent injuries, um, designing fitness programs for dogs, keeping them fit and healthy, um, helping other people keep their dogs fit and healthy and well conditioned, especially if you're involved in sport dogs and working dogs, check out um, our program. It's called the Elite Canine Athlete Program. It's an online program, so you can study it in the convenience of your own home. And um, it can lead to, you have the option of doing it with or without certification, but it can lead to becoming a certified canine athlete specialist. And if you go to my website, I have different programs. You can go and download the brochure. But let me throw the link in the chat box here. You can also um, Google uh, Elite Canine Athlete um, and uh, it should come up, but I'll put that. Um, oh, if you guys are not watching this, when I'm using the chat box and posting stuff, I am on the Northeast Canine Conditioning Facebook business page. So if you're watching this elsewhere and you're like, where's the link? I don't see it. It's because um, this is being broadcasted in other sites. So um, I will go write your questions. If I didn't see your comments, I will go afterwards and I will see them. But um, I'll also go and post these links after I'm done live. Uh, but just so you know, whenever I'm live, um, if you want to interact, interact directly live in the moment, you want to be on the Northeast Canine Conditioning Facebook business page. Um, but that is the Elite Canine Athlete Program. So yeah, Giselle just graduated from the program. Erica, you graduated a while ago. How long has it been? I think it's been over a year and a half, two years. It's been a while since you graduated. And we got some more. Uh, Denise is here. Uh, Denise is, she knows. Um, Denise, I, I um, missed your, your comment. Denise said, your boy's 13 years old, retired cadaver dog. He seems to still enjoy those search games for fun. Yeah, you want to um, keep stimulated, not just physically, but mentally. Yeah. I, Denise, I just saw your comment there. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, you guys, we had, we covered a lot today. You had awesome, amazing questions, um, great topics. Uh, I hope I gave you some things to think about, you know, not, not just for the senior dogs, but I would say they need special attention. We, we really need to, you know, they served us well. We, we've done a lot with them and for them, and we, we've got to do the most we can to help them just, you know, make the most of their time with us. I've had a number of people ask me, um, am I going to get another dog? And when am I going to get a puppy? I've got two dogs and the way I look at it is, um, you know, I don't know, I want Bachi to be here a long time, but you know, he's going to be 11 soon and uh, I don't know how long he's going to be here and I want to enjoy as much time as I can with him. And um, I would love to have a puppy, but um, I know that if I have three dogs, it's going to take attention away from the other two dogs. So um, for me, I just, I, I want to make the most uh, with him, spend as much time with him, have special memories with him, you know, going on our hikes together. And, um, and that's my, that my focus right now is um, just really enjoy those, the senior years, the senior days, the senior months, and um, really appreciate and embrace the time that we spend with them. Cause unfortunately they don't, you know, they typically don't live as long as we do. <laughs> yeah. um, their their lifespans. I wish wish they were here forever with us and um, didn't leave us. But um, but that's that's definitely my my focus is to, to both dogs. But like I said, especially after that surgery, we're we're lucky to have them still here with us. So, uh, all right, you guys. Any questions? Any other questions? Thank you, Giselle. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks. Yep, Erica. Yeah, Denise, you said you feel the same. Yeah, I, I get puppy fever, but I'm like, no, I want to, you know, my two dogs right now, and especially Bachi, especially when, you know, I very easily could have, you know, lost him that day. Very, we were very lucky to have him with, with me still. And um, so, yeah, 
gonna enjoy it. All right, you guys, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna log off now and go hang out with Bachi downstairs and maybe eat some popcorn and watch watch a movie or something and then have some quality time with him. Um, uh, if you guys have any questions, have a topic you wanna cover, please shoot me a message. Um, if you want the slides from today, um, just put in the comments slides or just message me your email and I'll send you the slides. Um, but every Friday, uh, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time is when you will find me on the Northeast Canine Conditioning Facebook business page. And again, if you're watching this elsewhere, I will go, I'll see your comments, I'll answer questions, and I'll share the links. But um, but if you want to catch me live, go to the Northeast Canine Conditioning Facebook business page. And I love when you guys are here live and asking questions and, and participating. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, thank you. All right, logging off. Have a great time. and. Go spend some time with your young dogs, your puppies, and your old dogs, and um, and put some of these uh, these tips to practice. I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye for now.